Good afternoon. Um, I'm Fran Mallory. I'm Development Director at Churchill College. Um, thank you very much for joining us online today for this talk, um, which is Churchill College Origin and Context. Um, of course, as most of you will know, this is the 60th anniversary year since the college's foundation. Um, and so it's a great event to mark this um, talk about the origin of the college, uh, while some of our celebratory events have been postponed until 2021, when we hope we can meet in person. So I'm delighted to introduce Professor Mark Goldie, who is giving the talk and will be known to many of you. Um, a little bit about Mark. Um, he came to Cambridge to study for a PhD at Corpus Christi before moving to Gonville and Keyes College as a research fellow. And he's been a fellow of Churchill since 1979 and served as admissions tutor and vice master in that time. Um, in his university role, he was professor of intellectual history and served as chair of the history faculty. He's published extensively on politics and ideas in Stuart and Hanoverian Britain. And he's the college's strictly unofficial historian and is author of Churchill College, The Guide and Corbusier Comes to Cambridge, Post-War Architecture and the Competition to Build Churchill College. Um, and just to explain that now we'll go to a video and into Mark's talk. Um, we have got some slides to accompany the talk and we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So if you want to uh, ask a question, please use the Zoom Q&A function that you should have on your screen. Thank you. In his London home, Sir Winston Churchill meets the other trustees of the proposed new Cambridge College, which will bear his name. It is only four weeks since the Churchill College Appeal Fund was launched, with a target of three and a half million pounds, and already more than half that sum has been collected. One of the first contributions was a cheque for 25,000 pounds from Sir Winston himself. Donations have come mainly from British industry, commerce and finance. For 70% of the members of the new college will study science and technology, subjects very dear to Sir Winston and to Lord Tedder and his fellow trustees. The ex-premier has never ceased to campaign for better scientific education. Churchill College will help to make his dreams come true. Well, thank you, Fran, for that introduction. Thanks very much and welcome to you all. What I'd like to do in this talk, which will probably take about 35 minutes, is to offer you a story of two origins of the college and then six contexts. When I get to the context, I'm going to broaden the uh, field of vision and look at some of the ways in which the announcement of the college in 1958 reflected some of the anxieties and hopes of Britain. But I'm going to begin with a narrative of two origins of the college. What I want to stress first of all is that this talk is about the 1950s. We think of Churchill quite rightly as a 60s college because it officially began in 1960, because the students arrived in the 60s and the buildings were built in the 60s. But those who created the college were of an earlier generation and they were doing their thinking and their planning in the previous decade. And as we all know, the 50s was a very different world from the 1960s. For one thing, everybody in my story is male, but then that's the 1950s for you. So let's turn next, Fran, to the next slide. And what we see here is the charter, 3rd of August, 1960. So it is our 60th birthday, wonderfully feudal document in which Her Majesty creates the college. But as I say, we're gonna scroll back earlier than that to the 50s. The college was announced in 58, and it was the culmination of two separate independent projects which got going from the early 1950s onwards. And it's very important to stress at the outset that initially both these schemes had no thought of a college at Cambridge. That was a late development. And that these two schemes operated quite separately until they were brought together. And also to stress that when the college did arrive in a Cambridge context, this involved something of a compromise of the ideals and hopes of some of those involved. But both schemes had in common the anxiety recurrent in Britain since the end of the first industrial revolution, that British society did not adequately nurture its technologists and scientists, and that economic and political and cultural leadership lay with those who were ignorant of or deprecated engineers, technologists, and scientists. Now, the first story of origins is 
easily the most famous to us at Churchill College, and that's Winston's own involvement. In 1949, he gave a speech at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and expressed the wish there that there would be something, could be something in Britain like MIT. And the notion of a British MIT has been a kind of ghost hovering over the college ever since. But in fact, it was never a realizable ambition simply because there could be no laboratories in a college. Now, in fact, Churchill did nothing about this ambition during his next premiership. It's often forgotten that he had a peacetime premiership as well as his famous wartime one between 1951 and 1955 an often forgotten and perhaps best forgotten premiership because he was not at his best as he approached 80 years old and not a lot happened in that administration, which is ironic because as we'll see when we come to the second narrative of origins, the second scheme, those involved there got frustrated by the lack of action from government. But when Winston finally retired in April, 1955 at the age of 80, he went to recuperate on holiday in Sicily. He intended to paint and to play cards over whiskey in the evening. But it rained much more than you'd expect in Sicily. And the college owes its origins, owes its existence to unexpected rain in Sicily. Now with Churchill there were two companions and they got into discussion. And these two companions are the first two of three godfathers of the college I want to introduce you to. Let's have the next slide. Oh, let's, I forgot about this one. Let's have a quick look at this one. This are the first students, the postgraduates who arrived in 1960. And it was very significant fact that we began with postgrads rather than undergrads. And there's Richard Hay, the first prelector and the first students. Don't they look a sober lot? Let's move on. Here we are. This is the first of our three godfathers, John Rupert Colville, Harrow and Trinity College, Cambridge, the very epitome of the British upper classes, a smooth man of the British establishment, a diplomat, an RAF pilot. He had been page to King George V. He was then secretary to Princess Elizabeth, the present queen, and later a banker. Because, incidentally, he was secretary to the Queen, his diaries from the 1950s are not yet available, and I've been refused access to them because of that secretaryship. But the key thing about him was that he was the personal secretary during wartime of Winston Churchill, deeply close to Winston for the rest of his career. And incidentally, if you want my recommendation for the by far the best first-hand account of Winston Churchill in wartime, then go to uh, Colville's book, Fringes of Power, his diaries from Downing Street, diaries he certainly oughtn't to have been keeping in Downing Street during the war. Now, the second godfather there in that conversation in Sicily, let's have the next one, please, is Frederick Lindemann, who became Lord Charwell, at least that's how I think it's pronounced in Oxford, Charwell. He was always known as the prof, he was an emigre German physicist who set up the Clarendon Laboratory in Physics in Oxford and became very close to Winston. He was the key scientific advisor for Winston in wartime, uh, stationed at number 10, and one of the chief architects of the strategic bombing campaign over Germany. In temperament, totally unlike Winston, a teetotal Puritan, which Winston was not, and nonetheless, they got on like a house on fire. In fact, Lindemann was much resented for his power and influence and had a famous quarrel with Sir Henry Tizard, father of Dick Tizard, who is in the college's history, our most important uh, senior tutor from the 1960s and 70s. In fact, Tizard and Lindemann had previously been friends and Dick Tizard's uh, literal godfather was Lindemann. When Lindemann talked about the need for more training of te technologists in Britain, we find it's really Winston who is simply parroting him. It was Lindemann over and over again, including in speeches in the House of Lords, that plugged away at this issue. So in these conversations in Sicily, Winston bemoaned not being able to, to have, uh, when he was in government, put forward his scheme for an advanced technological college. But Colville said it was not too late to act and that he himself would do the legwork. And that is what Colville set about doing. 
with unstoppable optimism and guilt-free opportunism, armed with Winston Churchill's vast reputation and with his own contacts in high places, he plunged in with industrialists, politicians and academics, hoping to raise money for a scheme. And his scheme was extremely ambitious. It would be postgraduate only. It would be science and technology only. It was for the advanced training of men, men, with, who would have several years industrial experience already. It was to be independently funded by private enterprise. It was to be run mainly by industrialists and not by academics. There'd be a scheme for traveling fellowships, visiting American professors. All this had only a passing resemblance to an Oxbridge College, and that was not the intention that it should be so. But Colville didn't make as much progress as he hoped. There was too much suspicion of the notion of an entirely independent institution of advanced studies. And at some point in the 50s, late 50s, he discovered that his particular wheel had already been invented. And now we come to the second set of origins, which is much best, less well known than Winston and his famous MIT speech or the Sicilian conversation. In about 1950, in the offices of Shell Petroleum in London, a group of businessmen of leading industries, ICI, Courtauld's and so on, met together. What they sought was again more training for high-grade technologists as they call them, practical men, I'm quoting, not research or academic men. And the keynote would be to imbue their education with, quotes, an industrial philosophy. They also wanted this to be independent of universities. They were doubtful that universities would adopt a fundamentally economic approach. Again, their phrase. And here we come to the third godfather, a man called John Augustus Oriel. I'm afraid I don't have a picture of him, so perhaps we'll now remove Frederick Lindemann for a while. Fran. Um, we can leave those there. They're the trustees we saw on the Pathé newsreel earlier. Our third godfather is John Oriel, University College Cardiff, the Royal Engineers. A leader in chemical engineering at Shell who had great importance in the 30s and early 40s in ensuring that the RAF had the right kind and the right amount of aviation fuel. He'd been blinded in the trenches of the First World War by mustard gas, but had recovered his sight, though later, around 1950, he lost his sight again. So he stood back from frontline work with Shell and started to lead the educational program of Shell. And it was he who brought together those captains of industry for these meetings at Shell. Now, there are two interesting facts about uh, John Oriel. One is that uh, he later became a founding fellow of the college, and he has the distinction of being the only fellow of Churchill College ever who was born in the 19th century, 1898. The other intriguing fact about him is that he is the father-in-law, was the father-in-law of Sir David Attenborough. And in fact, I've got here um, a letter written just a few weeks ago to Chris Riley, one of our alumni from Sir David Attenborough, which is a wonderful letter I wish I could share with you today. Wonderful both because it shows the sheer vitality of a man of 94, but also a very poignant account of his memories of his, uh, of his uh, wife's father from the 1950s and 1960s. Now, the Shell Group looked for a site to create their institution. They began talks with Cranfield, which was then the National Aeronautical College. They were advised they should link up with an existing university. So they turned to Birmingham. And what followed were long and futile negotiations in which the university professors resisted a semi-detached institution, which would be industry driven and not in their control they thought that academics should control the curriculum. They too, the Oriel group, were frustrated by these negotiations and frustrated at not getting much help, any sign of help from government. By about 1957, these two missions were badly in need of a rescue package. 
And at some point, Colville and Oriel were brought together. And the man who brought them together was Alexander Todd. I'm not quite sure how this occurred, but the Cambridge connection now came into view. Alexander Todd, later Lord Todd, Nobel laureate in chemistry, later master of Christ's College, was a very big figure in Cambridge science in the 50s. And incidentally, it was he who was widely tipped to become the first master of Churchill College, not Cockcroft. And Todd, like the other science barons of Cambridge, was very interested in shifting the balance of power within Cambridge, moving away from the arts, giving more space to technology and science. They were particularly worried at how dominated the colleges were by the arts and the growing number of scientific staff, uh, both permanent and temporary, who had no college connection whatsoever. Now, Todd understood Cambridge politics. He knew that the schemes that had been so far developed would have to be shoehorned into a conventional college structure and that without compromises there was no hope of the scheme coming to fruition or getting approval in Cambridge. There would have to be undergraduates for a start. The notion of a purely postgraduate college was still just over the horizon. It wasn't until 1965 that Wilson College was created as the first purely postgraduate college. There'd have to be students in the humanities too, otherwise the college could never be sold to the university. In fact, that almost was the sticking point. The fact that the college was to have a statutory insistence on 70% science and technology nearly scuppered the college. And years later, I met at dinner in Churchill, a uh, senior figure of the university, the master of another college, who confessed to me that he'd actually voted against the existing of the college, that was the existence of the college which was giving him his dinner that night. In fact, in the university debates in 1958, it was, I think, above all else, the sheer reputation of Winston Churchill, the fact that the college would be named for the great war hero that became a kind of steamroller that made it inevitable that the college would be accepted. But those who'd been involved in those earlier talks thought it something of a compromise, particularly the purely industrial ethos. Lord Charwell called it a compromise. And the government's first Minister of Science, appointed in 1959, not that he was a scientist, who heard about the project, called it a sadly meretricious curate's egg. But at any rate, the college was announced in May 58, and it was to be very large, with 600 fellows and students, to be named after a living person, and to have all its distinctiveness that we know of, the high emphasis on postgraduates, the 70% science ratio. And so the trustees here are appointed in 58. 10 of these 40 of the 14 trustees were born in the 19th century. They were essentially a second world war generation as their war heroes, war leaders like Lord Tedder, Marshal of the Air Force, uh, industrial captains of industry, and even one or two academics as well. It was they who took charge of the college, uh, of the shaping of the college for the next couple of years until the college came into being. Churchill, as we know, visited the site once in 1959. But what I want to turn to now in the second half of this talk is very speedily to look at some of the contexts of the 1950s that, if you like, flowed through the announcement of the college. We're talking now about the period from 58 to 60. And it's important to emphasize that the college did not yet exist. It existed only in the national imagination. The public announcement gave rise to a huge amount of public comment by the commentariat, by speechifiers, by journalists. And what I think they were doing were writing on the blank slate. And it became a wonderful, I think, for the historian, a wonderful microcosm of many of the hopes anxieties and attitudes of the 1950s as people talked about this great new institution and it got huge coverage. It was mentioned in the Houses of Commons. Uh, Harold Wilson 
jumped on the bandwagon, warming up for his uh, white heat of the technological revolution moment when he demanded of government in 58, is the government going to put money into this great new college? So here very quickly are six contexts that I can just very quickly sketch that uh, flowed through, got written onto the blank slate. First of all, of course, the great cult of Winston Churchill himself. In the 50s, Winston's reputation was unassailable. The greatest living Englishman, the savior of, li of liberty and of humanity, the greatest living Englishman and so on. And so the plaudits carried on and on. He was a colossus. This was not the Winston Churchill whom the left had always seen as a, as a class warrior against working people. This was not the Winston Churchill that the suffragettes had suffered under. This was not the Winston Churchill whom we discuss today as an antiquated imperialist and a racist. This was the Churchill of wartime. And as I think any member of this college knows, there's a sense in which as the college's psychological root is 1940, that great mythic moment of Britain standing alone with Churchill at the helm. And we all know how much of the insignia of the college, including our hideous colors of, hide of chocolate and pink, owe to Winston Churchill and our very, um, our very uh, motto forward comes from his first speech as prime minister in May uh, 19, uh, 1940. I always like the fact that when we buried Dick Tizard, whom I mentioned earlier, that great senior tutor, when we buried him in 2005, the music that he chose to be buried to was the Dam Busters March. This was the wartime generation. Well, the second context, the second theme is the end of empire. Part of the point of the cult of Winston was a kind of fig leaf to cover up the fact that the British were worried about their position as a world power. The British loved to hang on to that great photograph of Winston Churchill at Yalta in 1944, sitting alongside Roosevelt and Stalin, governing the world. But empire was dissolving fast. Extraordinarily, the magazine Nature, in its leader column, in 58 about the new college, its headline was our position as a great power. And it used the college announcement as a hook to talk about this anxiety of the end of empire. What could replace a territorial empire? Well, the answer and the story that Britain told itself was an empire of brains. But what we had was our intellectual capital left. And in the 50s, it was still possible to tell a very self-flattering story of Britain's great technological achievements for the previous 20 years. Atomic science, the first country in the world to put nuclear electricity into the grid. Penicillin, radar, the jet engine. There's a remark of Winston Churchill, which is today inscribed above our college bar and quoted quite often in our college literature, the empire of the future will be the empire of the mind. We're well, apt to think of that as a metaphor, but I think it was also quite literal. This was a country whose empire was declining. So let's clutch on to the hope of an empire of the mind instead. And once again, Manchester, the speechifying of the time, combined this notion of the new empire of the mind with the Second World War. Colville, there's a wonderful phrase from Colville, the battle of Britain of the future will be fought not on the beaches, but in the laboratories. And Winston in his letter to industry in 1958, appealing for money said, we are still a great power, but it's only in the discovery of new worlds of science and engineering that we shall be able to hold on to our position. Context three, the Cold War. That speech that uh, Winston gave in MIT was also a Cold War speech, as was his famous Iron Curtain speech of 1946. But in relation to the launch of Churchill, it's a very important fact that in the autumn of 57, the Russians put Sputnik up, the world's first probe into space. It terrified the West. 
and it led to a huge higher investment, particularly in America, in technological education. It's extraordinary the amount of talk in the 50s about Russian engineering and Russian science. We who now live after the end of the Soviets, after the 1990s, are very puzzled, I think, by this mixture of uh, admiration and fear for the reputation of Russian science and engineering and physics in the 1950s. So Sputnik was launched in 57 and Churchill College was launched a few months later as, uh, believe it or not, the West reply to the Soviets. And all the way through the literature of the founding of Churchill College is the talk, the echo, the drumbeat of the Cold War. Here is a, a quick, quick quotation from a letter that Winston Churchill wrote to the Prime Minister Macmillan in 1958, telling Macmillan about his new college. My dear Harold, I have been convinced for a long time that we ought to do all we can to improve Britain's technological education. I was warned by the prof, that's Charwell again, I was warned by the prof as long ago as 1954 that the Russians were getting ahead of us. His forebodings have been all too justified. So this is Churchill's letter to Ch Macmillan about the college and it's banging on about the Russians. And as the Daily Telegraph's own leading article about the Churchill College announcement said, we are surpassed by the Russians on an alarming scale. Context four, Cavendish physics, the Boffins War, and the peaceful atom. Those who created Churchill College, the first fellows, not the trustees, but the fellows who came to college in 1960, many of them had been wartime scientists. They hadn't had what are now conventional academic careers because they'd been drafted in because of their science knowledge into the wartime effort. The moment, the period at which was the closest connection that Britain has seen between science and warfare, science and government. Tied in also with the huge reputation of the Cavendish Laboratory, Cavendish Physics. And of course, our first master, Cockcroft. Let's see Cockcroft now, Fran. Um, no, sorry, let's pause <laughs> quickly on this letter. This, you can't read it from where you're sitting, but the point is that it's a letter from Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, just to illustrate the great impact that the college announcement had in 58. So here's a letter personally from Eisenhower to Winston 58, congratulating him on the new college. What's next in our slides? That's a cartoon um, that shows the kind of publicity we had, a small boy caught smoking a cigar and saying, hey, hang on, um, I'll be applying to Churchill College so I can smoke my cigar. Next. Yes, Churchill College for Space Age Men. This is the theme of the Space Age of which I was talking of the Cold War of Sputnik. And now we come to the Atom Age, particularly when Cockroft was appointed in 59, the great atom scientist, a man who had enormous reputation in the 50s um, as Britain's atom chief, as Picture Post called him. He led the great program of civil nuclear power in the 1950s. He was head of Harwell, which uh, was a semi-secret institution, which I always think of as the great unannounced university of the 1950s because it sucked up so many of the physicists of the country and was offering, this is a kind of alongside the Cold War, offering a new vision of the peaceful atom of unlimited, almost free nuclear power. Cockcroft was a great prophet of a Utopia, which of course never came to pass, of virtually free nuclear electricity, which would solve the world's energy problems. I always feel this theme is summed up by a wonderful piece of silver that we place on our high table at college feasts, the atomic rose bowl, a beautiful piece of work which shows the structure of an atom, uh, signifying peace and plenty through the atom. But Cavendish physics, Cockcroft symbolized Cavendish physics because he had got the Nobel Prize for splitting the atom. Let's see the next one. There's Cockcroft, the first master of the college. And then I love the next picture. This takes us back to 1932 in the Cavendish laboratory. This is their equipment for splitting the atom. What I love about it is the tea chest covered in lead. This is their wonderfully sophisticated protection against radiation. 
So the Boffins War is a great leg up to science in the scientific war of the 40s, Cavendish physics, the peaceful atom. Context five, the two cultures. I mentioned right at the start the constant anxieties that have been voiced ever since the Victorian age, that not only were we falling behind after the first industrial revolution, but the part of the problem was a cultural one, that in Britain, the old humanist elites trained in the classics and the humanities dominated culture, politics, government, industry. And what we needed was a far greater sense of the, a far greater estimation of the role of scientists and practical people in engineering as well as in pure science. And many of the headlines at the time talked about killing the snobbery, overcoming the old elitism of the arts and humanities. As the Daily Telegraph put it, away with the outmoded contempt for the men in the white coats. So the fact that Churchill's name was attached to a college at Oxbridge meant that at last science was getting the headlines it deserved. Let's see a headline in the next slide. Cinderella science goes to the ball at last. So here was the final arrival of science. Now, it's a very important fact relating to Churchill College that in 1959, C.P. Snow, Sir Charles Snow, novelist, uh, scientific civil servant, gave perhaps the most, one of the most famous lectures of the 20th century, the two cultures. And Snow was a founder fellow of the college. So that two cultures lecture and debate is very much tied to the history, the early history of the college. And in that famous lecture, he precisely argued that it was time for the humanities to move over. You saw on that slide earlier of Lindemann, one of his, uh, his own quotations, Lindemann was constantly saying, the trouble with people is that they could uh, quote you bits from the classics and the ancient world, but they didn't know the first thing about science. And that was C.P. Snow's theme as well. C.P. Snow, incidentally, found a fellow of the college, the only fellow in the history of Churchill College to be a government minister because he became Minister of Technology, Junior Minister of Technology in Wilson's government in 1964, that government that was founded on that uh, amazing speech that Wilson gave in 63 on the white heat of the technological revolution. Finally, context six, meritocracy. Meritocracy. It's very striking if you look at the literature of 1958, 59, 60, how frank and unembarrassed the literature is about speaking of the new college as training a new elite. The word elitism had not yet acquired its negative connotation. Today, today, you don't talk about elites positively, except in football, of course. But the elitist tone in the 50s was quite frank. Remember, in those, those period, 1950s, only 5% of the age group went to university. There was great faith in IQ testing. And there was a deep sense that although the college would be a big one in Cambridge terms, it was going to be small nationally. It was going to be a hothouse for the very cream of the new technological elite. Out with the old elites, not for the sake of democracy or equality, but no in with a new elite, the technical elite. And the last figure I want to mention uh, in the closing moments is Another founding fellow, a great hero of mine, Michael Young, later Lord Young of Dartington, who in 1958, although he became a founding fellow of the college in 1960, he had huge misgivings about Cambridge and even of Churchill College, though he quite liked Churchill. Uh, he was far more of an educational Democrat. And he was very fearful of that uh, the new educational milieu of the 50s was creating a new elite that was dangerous in its implications. Okay, we were getting rid of the old elite of money, of inheritance, and of the purely classics and humanities, but the new elites would be just as dominant. And in 1958, that crucial year again, 58, he published an enormously important book, which I recommend to you all, called The Rise of the Meritocracy, very relevant in our own debates right now. The Tyranny of Merit, to give the title of a book that came out just the other week on the same theme. 
So this college was to be unabashedly for a new elite. Well, I'm closing now. I've got one more minute. I brought us to 1960 and quite deliberately, here's C.P. Snow, quite deliberately uh, to the moment at which the college actually did begin in 1960. I'm not talking here, it's another talk about the great cultural revolution of the 60s. In many ways, of course, the college was progressive in its notions in 60, and yet it failed to see many of the things that would come over the horizon in the 60s. Above all, the fact that it was quite natural in 1960 to create an all-male college, which would be unthinkable only 10 years later. But all the changes of the 60s are a different story. And I end now at August 1960, when the vision finally set foot here in West Cambridge as Churchill College. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. That, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I have heard a similar talk before that you've given, but it's always incredibly enlightening. Um, so we, are, we do have some questions um, now from people in the audience. Um, I will read them out and I think the first one is more of a comment um, we, uh, from Naomi Caligaro. Um, we do well to remember that Britain wasn't actually alone during the two world wars. Britain was supported by vast numbers of brave young men from India, Africa, the Caribbean, Australia, the Irish Free State and elsewhere. India Sikhs in particular distinguished themselves for their skill and valour. Britain owes a great debt to all those men and their countries. Um, and I'm sure we all agree with that. Completely. I'm very, very much uh, glad you made that that comment. I did quite deliberately talk about the myth of 1940, mm -hmm. and central to that myth, as you're pointing out, is that Britain stood alone, which is a great myth indeed. What I love doing when I, I give a, uh, an annual course of lectures to the International Summer School of Winston Churchill, and I always launch into the myth because uh, I know it's pressing a button, because there's bound to be a Pole in the room, someone from Poland, or a, or a Canadian in the room, or an Indian in the room, who very quickly point out exactly what's just been said. Uh, it was far from the case that Britain stood alone. Even those um, spitfires over Kent uh, were full of Polish and Canadians as well. Thank you. Um, so we've got another question from Graham Thomas. Um, did the founding of Churchill as a science college play into the founding of the new universities of the 1960s in any way? Well, that was wonderful coincidence, that question, because tomorrow I am going to be on a Zoom uh, for the launch of a new book called The Utopian Universities of the 1960s. And it's a book about the creation of those new universities, one of which I went to myself, the University of Sussex, founded also in 19. Uh, 60. And when that book was planned, there was some thought of including um, chapters on one or two of the uh, innovative colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, which would have been this one, and uh, St. Catharines in Oxford. But they decided to stick with the universities. Uh, there's no doubt that a lot of common currents in educational thought uh, flowed through the creation of the so-called Magnificent Seven of new universities of the 60s, as well as um, uh, Churchill and Cambridge, and its nearest parallel in Oxford, which is St. Catharines. We could talk more about that another time, perhaps. Um, thank you. Um, another comment um, and question from John Johnson. Wonderful, will your text be available? Perhaps you could. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I believe the recording is there going is a to, recording. With, yeah. There is a recording, and, and that will be made available. Um, my long term hope. Uh, is, uh, well, in fact, I'm gradually doing it, but all too slowly. I'm writing a history of the beginnings of the college. And uh, as I've tried to emphasize, I want that to be not uh, just a, um, a sort of microscopic internal history of what one committee said to another committee, but to try and do what historians do and contextualize and see the ways in which uh, the, the mid 20th century reverberates through the college. Thank you. Um, the next question from Lucas Meyer um, saying, thanks, how was the site in Cambridge chosen? That's a, that's a good question. Um, well, our wonderful 48 site was owned by St. John's College and uh, St. John's had great insight. They had earmarked it for a future college uh, development of a future college um, two or three decades earlier and the university had wanted to get its hands on it and uh, St. John said, no, we're hanging on to it for 
college rather than university development. But the whole land, all the land in West Cambridge was owned either by colleges or the university. And as we know, um, so many of the developments have been in this direction. When the college began, it seemed like a long way out from the center of town. Uh, but now, of course, Cambridge University has gradually um, crept westward to join us. Thank you. Um, there's a comment um, from Anthony Bainbridge. Bainbridge. Uh, we wanted to be elitist in the early 60s and mimic the traditional colleges. Was that was that true that we wanted to be like a traditional college? Mark? Well, I think it's um, the uh, alums who were here in the 60s who could answer that better than I. I think there are cross currents. I think there was on the one hand, um, uh, distinct pride in the college being distinct and difference, different with uh, students having to explain even the existence of the college to uh, some people in Cambridge. And um, some people uh, elsewhere in Cambridge looked down on what they call the Maddingley Road Tech. So um, explaining the college, defending it, though uh, I've often heard tell that the dreadfully cold winter of 1962-63 suddenly made the college seem a very good place to be because it was the only warm college in Cambridge. But on the other hand, and there's plenty of signs that the first students uh, did their best to um, turn the college into uh, a very traditional one in the sense of having all the clubs and societies and sports of other colleges um, and creating the infrastructure of college cultural and social life um, to reflect those of other of other colleges at the same time so I think it's very much cross-cutting. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Giles Mercer, are there two subcontexts, the thinking that God was dead and the general expansionist thinking about universities in general, leading, for example, to the Robbins Report of 1963? Thank you for that. Yes, um, I cut short at six contexts because um, there are others that are possible, but I didn't want to try you all too much. And I'd be delighted to hear from anyone who um, has thoughts about the, the other kinds of contexts that one could explore. Uh, yes, indeed, um, the high tide of secularism, um, the great debate about the whether to have a chapel or not, which is yet another possible lecture I could give another time. And as some of you will know, a huge row about whether or not to have a chapel um, uh, that broke out almost as soon as the college began in 1960. So that is uh, another story to tell. And expansion, yes, it's very interesting if you look at the debate in the Senate House in 1958, when the college had to get approval of the um, voting um, senior members of the university, one of the great fears was the college would simply be too big. And whereas most colleges started very small indeed with handfuls of people, uh, college, this college was announced straight away that within a few years it was planned to reach several hundred people. There were real fears that they would gobble up all the talent of the schools and of the university. They would make Cambridge expand too much. It's funny from our perspective now to think there were big worries in the mid-50s that Cambridge was expanding too much and that Churchill should not exist for that reason. Um, many of the ideas in the Robbins report flow through Churchill, uh, though Robbins was 1963. Uh, it's often forgotten that those new universities that we mentioned a moment ago got going even before Robbins. But expansion was, it was a theme. Um, and I have a secret notion that um, the notorious remark by uh, Kingsley Amis, more will mean worse, often quoted uh, by the conservatives who didn't want expansion, uh, that this would mean a, a watering down of university education across Britain. More will mean worse. In fact, uh, Kingsley Amos was then a fellow of Peterhouse in Cambridge, and I suspect he partly had Churchill College in mind when he said more will mean worse. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is a comment really um, uh, from Kyle. Hello, Mark. I was in your summer class in 2017 and enjoyed it immensely. So, so I just thought I'd, uh, so I'll just uh, um, and next one is from probably more of a comment from David Sesher, um, who's an alumnus, um, as he was at, that you, he'd forgotten that you were at Corpus before Keys, and then and now he's now interim bursar at Corpus, having been bursar at Keys. Um, so I um, and then there's the next one isn't I don't think a question. But Philip Evans, um, shouldn't we make more of the quotation, Felix? Felix Quipotwit rerum cognoscere causas, which is on the wall near the Porter's Lodge. 
is it not rather better than forward? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, again, I'm glad that has been mentioned. That is the Latin remark. So much for doing away with the classics. Um, that is a Latin quotation that is at the uh, Porter's Lodge. And um, I've suddenly forgotten where it's from. It's from um, uh, I'm now being embarrassed. I've completely forgotten who it's from. It, 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 it's, it's Isn't it Virgil? It's Virgil. Thank you very I much. Think. It's Virgil. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Splendid. Friday. Yeah, excellent. excellent. Um, and it it um, reflects the, the, the scientific ethos. Uh, blessed is he or, or happy is he who knows the causes of things, the origins of things. It can be translated in various ways. And uh, yes, forward, the single word forward is in a, in a way a bit, bit dull. Somewhere in the archive, um, and I can't lay my hands on at the moment, is uh, the notes of a wonderful debate among the trustees in which they all tried to come up with mottos for the college. And some of them are completely daft, but unfortunately, um, I can't find the document at the moment. Thank you. Um... Gary, Gary Lindbergh um, is asking, our first year, 1960, had representatives from many different countries. Was this deliberate? I wish I knew the answer to that question. I think it um, may have been deliberate. It's always been the case, still is the case, that the postgraduate community in Cambridge is far more international than the undergraduate community. And I guess that was so then. But I think it was also deliberate because part of Colville's notion, late imperial notion, was to provide a hub for educating people from across the world. We have to remember that one of the last phases of empire in the 50s was a very, um, what will now seem patronizing, but a very, as it were, humani what was meant to be a very humanitarian notion uh, that um, Britain wasn't in empire any longer uh, for simply the territory and the world power status, but in order to encourage development. And Colville, whose language was always like Winston Churchill's very imperial, uh, there's a quote I, I didn't um, have time to give, but here it is. He wanted it to be an imperial centre, imperial, still often the word was often used in the late 50s still, an imperial centre to which young men from the dominions and colonies will come. Uh, that shows just how, what the mindset was then. But I think it did mean that, um, that there was a very mixed um, body of, of, of students from all over the world. And it's interesting that quite a handful of the early fellows of the college, I, I mentioned early fellows who'd been involved in world time science, but there's another cohort who often had part of their careers in new universities in uh, Africa and Asia uh, in the 19, 1950s before coming to Churchill. Um, one of them was a classicist um, who was actually flung out of Rhodesia because he opposed uh, Rhodesian apartheid and was kicked out by the white supremacists there. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of comments and then uh, Mike Marriott is asking, did Oxford make any response to a possible advantage that the other place now had? Well, I've mentioned that the parallel is with St. Catherine's, and uh, at some point I want to look at the St. Catherine's archives in Oxford. Um, it was also spanking new, wonderful set of buildings designed by a um, uh, not, not a British architect. Um, the trustees at Churchill put their foot down and said the architect of Churchill co uh, Churchill's College had to be British. Um, Catherine's also had uh, a big emphasis on, on science. And what I do know is that um, uh, Bullock, the um, founding master of St. Catharines, did have some problems raising funds because of money being sucked up by Churchill College. The initial funding drive for Churchill was very successful, although too much of it got gobbled up in building the buildings. In Cambridge, um, the real damage was done, I think, to um, college, to, to New Hall next door, which was a fledgling women's college, which was uh, desperate for funds in the 50s and found a lot of the available money going to Churchill instead. Thank you. Um, another question from David Setcher. Who were the other founding trustees in the photograph? Um, do you want me to go back? To well, uh, don't go back to the picture, oh. well, unless you want to go back to the picture, because I won't be able to put names to them all. I've got a list of the trustees, but I really ought to attach them to um, to their visage visages. Um, they were, as I said, um, only about three of the 14 in all, three or four of them were academics. Um, Lord Adrian, the uh, Nobel physiologist um, of Trinity, um, 
Tedder, the former master, former um, head of the Royal Air Force. There was one trade union representative there because one of the aspects, this is yet another context, the interesting coming together of industry and the trade unions as reflected in our college library, which has um, the, the Bevan Library, the, the great labor uh, trade union leader. Um, there were politicians in there. There was, there was Lord Shandos, who was one of Churchill's uh, um, ministers and head, head of, I think, ICI, Lord Knollys. So a lot of the biggest names in British industry, particularly Lord Shandos and Lord, uh, Lord, Lord Knollys. But I can't off the top of my head name them all. Thank you. Um, uh, there's another question from Jan Jun Mai. Excellent talk. Thanks. What was the intellectual background for C.P. Snow to raise the issue of two cultures? Well, I'm tempted to say read, read all his novels. Do people read C.P. Snow's novels anymore? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, they're, they're wonderful of their era. Um, one of the aspects of the famous row that Snow had was the uh, blistering retort that came from F.R. Levis of Downing College, who, among many things, said that Snow didn't even know what a novel was uh, and was uh, an idiot to think that he wrote good novels. But anyway, Snow had been a flourishing physicist at the Cavendish in the 1930s, but then found uh, that uh, his science petered out, but became much more influential as a scientific civil servant. He, it was, who selected physicists and others for wartime science and for Harwell after the wars. Behind the scenes, very important as a recruiter of science, scientists for government, while all the time uh, writing novels. Um, if you look particularly at a novel of the 50s called The New Men, it really is about Cockcroft and the Cavendish physicists. Um, and uh, it was this background that led him to give his, his famous speech in, in 59. Um, although by career best known as a novelist, um, his background was, in, was in, in physics and he knew all these physicists very well indeed. And this is why he ended up in government uh, and he was an advisor to Labour at the end of the 50s and the early 60s. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Judy Hollier. Scientists are still very scarce in government. Is there any prospect for this to change or will the hopes of the founders of the college never be met? Well, I think there are several aspects of the college which you could ask were they ever achieved. That is one of them and a, and a closely related one of them is the um, much vaunted connection between the college and industry. Colville and Oriel hope for very, very close ties with industry. And of course, there have been many ties um, over the years between the college and industry, more than other colleges, simply because we're a 70% science and technology. But most of those connections are really through departments and labs, as you'd expect. And um, it's been quite hard to give um, reality to that connection of science and industry. And likewise, the question of cultural leadership of science, which Judy's raising, uh, cultural leadership in science in this, in this country. Um, during the 60s and 70s, whenever the vacancy for the mastership of Churchill came up, uh, the shortlist was almost always some of the scientists who had been major advisors to government, people like Solly. Zuckerman, uh, who was a big figure in the 50s, in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So it was always that sense that Churchill would be a natural home for those who did become advisors to government. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I gather that in recent years, um, one good development has been that all major government departments have their own scientific advisors. And of course, during COVID, we have seen far more of scientists in government than uh, perhaps for uh, for a very long time indeed. Uh, watch the space. Thank you. Um, Chris Harvey is asking, did trade unions contrib contribute to the funding of Churchill? They did indeed, and it's something I'd like to investigate further and something I regret that the college has not done more, Fran, to acknowledge. Uh, that is uh, extraordinary fact that the Transport and General Workers Union gave £50,000, which you need to put at least um, uh, another naught on, if not two noughts on, for 1958. Why on earth did a major trade union, admittedly at a time when the trade unions were extremely powerful and wealthy, the leading ones in the country. Why did it give a large sum of money to a Cambridge college named after 
the great uh, class warrior, uh, Winston Churchill. I have a sneaking theory that it was a kind of um, elaborate joke. I mean, obviously it was meant seriously and had a serious outcome in the creation of our, of our Bevan Library. Bevan is an extraordinary man um, who was very close to Winston in government, but he was of working class roots. He left school at 14 and worked in the, in the shipyards in Glasgow and uh, came to fame through the trade unions and was the leader of Labour with a small L. Clem Antley was the official leader of the Labour Party, but the really big figure who um, mobilised uh, British working work, Labour in that sense, in the Second World War was, was Bevan. And it's a kind of backhanded, um, backhanded compliment to Winston Churchill, because I think the 1945 Labour landslide had something to do with the fact that Winston was so preoccupied with the war and was never much interested in domestic policy, he left it all to Labour to do, and because Labour had been so successful with Attlee and Bevan in running the home front in the Second World War, that they were elected to government in 45. So it was a kind of backhanded making of points, I think, apart from anything else in that um, great uh, wadge of money given by the T Transport General Workers Union. I'd again like to look at their archives and explore that fact. And I think it would be rather a nice gesture if periodically the college invited whoever is now, uh, the uh, whoever is the head of the Transport in General now. Yeah, that's one for me to remember next time we have a feast then. I'll, I will make note of that. Um, so next question, Grant Lewis, and the fact that the first students were grad were graduates had a bigger influence on the student partic participation in college life. In other colleges, graduates were second class citizens. Do you think that this was important to the development of the college? That's absolutely right. Um, and uh, you're, uh, you're quite right to say that in the late 50s, uh, the uh, forgotten cousins of the university were postgraduates who are very marginal. Most colleges took uh, really precious little notice of them. Very few colleges had separate MCRs. The notion of a middle common room was only created really in the 1960s. Uh, they were add-ons. And uh, it was just around 1960 that there began to be talk of the need to uh, provide more for postgraduates. Uh, and this was a national, national concern and it runs through the uh, Robbins report of 63. But as I mentioned, it wasn't until 65 that the first um, graduate college was, purely graduate college was created in, in Cambridge. Uh, there were then two or three more after that. So it was really um, a very striking fact that uh, in 1960, the first batch of students at Churchill were, were post-grads um, and that we had a 30%, a one third um, proportion. It's ironic, of course, that the university today as a whole has the same ratio. So in that sense, we've fallen behind the, or the university's caught up with the ratio that we began with. Thank you. Um, so apparently the quotation is from Virgil's Georgics. I don't know if you can see that. That was the- um, <laughs> Angry Isabel, thank you very much. Happy is he who knows the causes of things, that one. Um, uh, Eleanor has a question. Um, Thank you, but saying, could you say something about some of the early, some of the scientific technological advances or research which emerged from the early intake of students when they were at college or out in the world? Uh, that um, I ought to be more expert on than I am. Of the college's supposedly 32 Nobel Prize winners, one is a former student. The rest were former fellows or visitors. That's Roger Chen, who died uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we are producing more and more distinguished scientists and several of them now, two or three, four, five of them have been uh, among the alumni, have been elected to uh, honorary fellowships. As the college matures, we reach a point where we do as other colleges and uh, elect honorary fellows from among the alumni. I should say a word about the 32 Nobel Prizes. Um, all colleges cheat on this. Uh, anyone who sort of set foot in the place tends to be called a member of the college. And um, although we're very proud of this number, uh, most of them were visiting fellows, though our visiting fellow program was very important, particularly in the 19. 60s. And even the more homegrown people, uh, some of them got their Nobels for work done before the college existed, like um, Francis Crick and um, John Cockcroft. 
So I think we're down to about three homegrown um, Nobels among the fellows of the uh, college. Uh, there's the uh, Nobel for pulsars that Tony Hewish got uh, and that famously, notoriously, his female graduate student, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell of Newhall, uh, did not get. Um, the Nobel for the um, man who created test tube babies in the late next generation. Um, these are uh, among our two or three pr purely, truly homegrown Nobels. I think we need better mapping of the career trajectories of some of our uh, alumni, and it's something I'd, I'd uh, love to do more work on. Thank you. Um, there's another comment, and then um, oh, Benjamin Carter is asking a question. Could you address how the six contexts you've spoken about pervade the competition brief to the invited architects, if at all? Hmm. Yeah, well, you've perhaps deliberately touched on another fond subject of mine, and uh, you can get from the Porter's Lodge or the College Alumni Office a little booklet that I produced, which uh, Fran mentioned, called Corbusier Comes to Cambridge, the competition to build Churchill College. It, it is remarkable, that competition. The most remarkable thing is that uh, every one of those who was invited to send in designs. It was a limited competition by invitation only to 20 firms. Every single one was a modernist. That certainly would not have been the choice of the trustees, many of whom were highly skeptical, if not even more negative, about the designs when they saw them. And the only thing that they put their foot down on was that the architect must be British. So all those 20 were British. It was felt that the great hero Winston must have a British architect. Um, the um, man who achieved this uh, clear slate of modernists was um, Leslie Martin, who was the architectural advisor to the college, the university's first professor of architecture in 1956, who um, basically ran rings around the uh, around the trustees and organized this competition. And it is quite extraordinary, the visions that were produced. Some of them were to be high rise. There were, there were a whole variety of solutions. Many people feel, as, as I do, that although the actually built college is, is wonderful, the most brilliant conception, which was the runner up, which was thought, thought just a little too um, extreme to be built was by Hal Killick and Partridge, which, for which there's a wonderful image, which you'll find in the booklet, um, which actually is on the dust jacket of a book about the two cultures. And it's, it's a brilliant depiction of a modernist college set in Cambridge. And it's a painting by a woman artist who worked with the architectural firm. I'm sorry, since you've asked the question, I don't have the image here, but I'll just quickly describe it. What it combines is, on the one hand, hyper-modernist, jazzily moder modern uh, architecture with a jet aircraft flying across the sky overhead. Then, complete fantasy this, a little island was going to create a lake to extend the River Cam around the college and create an island on the lake in which Winston Churchill would be buried. And then in the forefront, by, the, by this extension to the river, is, is a young man sitting reading a book under a tree. So it kind of combines an image of the backs. They're going to kind of bring the backs and plonk it in front of the college, um, combined with this um, vision of a, of, a, of a stunning piece of modernism that was just a bit too much for, for those choosing the architect, with the jet aircraft going across the front. Jet aircraft, of course, it, every day to us now. But remember, 1958, I keep coming back to that year, 1958 was, uh, it was only about 1956, I think, that, that jet aircraft replaced propellers on the transatlantic flight. And the key thing about 58, believe it or not, it's the first year in which more people cross the Atlantic by aircraft than by ship. That just shows how long ago 1958 was. Uh, and I've emphasized 58 because although the college officially began in 60, um, all, the, all the 50s visions really key in on 58 when the college was announced. Thank you. Um, we've got time for another couple of um, 
questions. I'm just going to skip over some of the comments because they're they're very interesting and I think we can save them. So we will try and save I'd them. I'd love, our... love to read them and please do get in touch yeah, with me um, if, if you've got things you want so to say. about remembering Francis Qu Crick uh, dining on high table, um, which must have been amazing for, for a student at the time. Um, John Johnson um, remembering that um, Prime Minister Wilson was supposed to come to the dedication of some buildings but couldn't because um, Ian Smith declared independence. Um, mm. So th there's a lot of sort of interesting memories there. Um, I've got another question from Susan. Was there any concern by the university in the 1950s about the influence of commerce on academia as a possible result of the industry funding of the college? I'd like to be able to explore that. One of the things that's difficult to get at is um, exactly who opposed the um, college and uh, so to speak where they were coming from, um, including literally which colleges they were coming from. Um, it's a way, you know, for the historian, unfortunate that there was no vote eventually. There was a Senate House debate, which is a very revealing document. We've got the verbatim account of the Senate House debate in 19, um, 1958, which raised all the issues I've mentioned as, and some others as well, including why aren't the women and why isn't there a chapel? Those are uh, among the many issues raised in the debate. But the politicians, uh, university politicians who were um, organizing this, Todd, uh, uh, Noel Annan, incidentally, Lord Annan, very important figure, I should have mentioned him among the trustees, um, and others really ran rings around the opposition. And as I mentioned, the, the fact that it was going to be the national memorial for Winston was really the, the trump card, which made it virtually impossible for anyone to vote against it because it would look like voting against the Second World War or voting against victory. Um, so it's hard actually to pin down who the opponents were. Um, certainly one of them was, uh, was a remarkable figure, uh, perhaps typically a professor of Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, literature who uh, was very aged. He opposed almost everything. And in 1947, he had, he had been the only person to vote against the final decision to give degrees to women. So there were some dinosaurs in Cambridge who, who were opposed. But um, I'd love to be able to explore some in more detail, uh, the fears and, and um, opposition. There certainly would have been um, big opposition to uh, any commercial or industrial control. And it was a condition of the college becoming a fully fledged college university as that power had to be handed from the trustees to the fellows of the college. Officially, the trustees made the decisions, at least officially, uh, in the first half of the 60s. The college did not have become an official fully fledged college university until 66. Um, and that required the trustees to stand down and the fellows to take over. Thank you. Um, there's a couple more. I think we've only got, I'm just going to pick out a couple more because we haven't got very much time. Um, Paul Jeffrey, I believe Churchill was not enthusiastic about the architecture of the college. How was the decision on the architect and the sort of architecture he would produce made? Yes, Winston Churchill, as far as we know, was not keen on the, what he saw of the uh, of the designs for the building. Of course, he never actually saw the buildings as built. Um, we know what he would have liked because he proposed one particular architect and that suggestion was ignored. Uh, what he would have liked was something like um, Blenheim Palace, I think, lots of lots of classical pillars at the front. That would have pleased him. Something, I suppose, like Downing College with uh, classical pillars rather than Gothic. That would have suited him. Um, but of course, Winston Churchill by 1959-60 uh, was, uh, to put it crudely, out of it. Um, many of his supposed letters about the college weren't written by him, they were written by his secretaries um, who put his um, thumbprint at the bottom of it. Uh, he was failing in his powers very fast by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the 50s. Um, and he, he was the front man, the front figure of course, but he wasn't, he wasn't seriously involved. Thanks. Um... I think we've only got time for one more question. There's a question from Graham Thomas, which I think is probably one more one for the alumni office because it's the percentage of Churchill scientists and engineers that have ended up in finance, which I could probably answer <laughs> another time um, by email. Um, uh, but Mike Marriott, um, was there ever any discussion about the importance of developing the social sciences in Cambridge? That is an excellent question to end on and a theme I would want to um, underscore because uh, there was a great deal of talk at the end of the 50s, early 60s across 
across Britain, we can add this to the list of context, about the third way uh, in the great debate about the two cultures. There were a lot of people who said, well, what about the third culture of the social sciences? And a uh, university like the University of Essex, one of the magnificent seven of the early 60s, they began by having only science and social science. Humanities came later. So social science was making a big push uh, for uh, establishing itself. Economics was already fairly well established um, in, in Britain and in Cambridge, um, but um, sociology was very slow in coming indeed. And Michael Young, whom I uh, mentioned, was the university's very first lecturer in sociology and came to a, a um, fellowship of Churchill. One of the great things about early years of Churchill is that we were very open to new disciplines. Remember that one of the fears of the scientists in the late 50s was that the colleges were stuck in an arts rut um, and were not open to new subjects, particularly because new subjects weren't very relevant for teaching the existing triposes. Uh, I could reel off several professorships who were the first professors in the university in their disciplines who came to Churchill. So um, the uh, first professor of operational research became a, was offered a fellowship at Churchill. The university's first um, professor of, uh, of, of um, industrial relations industrial relations became a fellow of Churchill. The university's first lecturer in sociology, Michael Young, came to Churchill. So I think there's a really interesting story to be told, both about the social sciences and about being open to new disciplines. And I'd add a last thing, the history of science was very important uh, in the college's history because that was one of the great unifiers between arts and science, the, the great cultural divide of the two, the two cultures. And I'm prepared to say that if you look at the people who've been uh, on the fellowship in history of science from then until now, we probably have the strongest tradition in Cambridge of the history of science. Thank you. Well, I think I think we have to uh, end it there, unfortunately, because uh, Mark has to be somewhere else soon. And, uh, and I'm sure we could spend a lot longer, though, answer, asking lots of questions. So you, um, I just want to thank you again, Mark. And this will be we will try and save the questions and which I think is possible. Um, and try and answer some of them maybe later on. Um, and there will be more of these events next year and hopefully some live events as well. Um, but I'd just like to finish by thanking you, Mark, and uh, again, on behalf of everybody, on behalf of the alumni as well for a fascinating talk. Thank you.